Hey everyone, it's Mr. Anderson here. Today we're getting together to talk about section 7.1.6 from our CPM Common Core Algebra eBook. And our goal today is to take some situation problems and turn them into some graphs and some equations or start doing that because the story problems are, are maybe abstract and difficult things to work with, but if we can turn them into models that we can visualize, that might help us do some problem solving. A um, little taller of a task today. Uh, it's one of those things that students often wrestle with, but it doesn't mean we don't, excuse me, it doesn't mean we don't try, it doesn't mean we don't make an effort, and it doesn't mean we don't ask questions. So let's move into this type of a lesson with those kinds of things and that type of spirit in mind, okay? Um, we've got some notes that I've that I've truncated. Um, I'm, I'm going to start with a couple very specific problems because they highlight some some very, very important things uh, that we're going to need to, uh, to know. Um, like I said, we do want to go ahead and make sure that we are talking about how we can turn a situation into a graph and a situation to an, in, into an equation. So we're going to focus on those two things, and we may even come across using a table, um, and then, of course, allowing that to help us do some of that, right? So you kind of see how this web um, is starting to take um, take shape, right? First thing you have to do with any story problem or any situation problem is make sure you understand the situation. Sometimes this requires reading once, sometimes it requires reading three times. Don't be afraid to reread if you need to. Take the time, seek some of that understanding because if you don't understand the problem, you're very, very unlikely to be able to solve the problem. Okay, check it out. A virus has invaded Leticia's favorite mountain fishing lake. Currently, there are an estimated 1,800 trout in the lake, and the Fish and Game Department has determined the rate of fish deaths will be one-third of the population per week if left untreated. Okay, sketch a graph showing how many fish are left in Leticia's favorite lake over several weeks. Okay, first thing that I want you guys to, to notice, because I noticed this, is that we are told that 1,800 trout are currently in the lake. That tells me my starting value. So I'm just going to make note of that. A is 1,800. Okay, the other thing that would be really, really helpful for me when sketching this graph is if I knew what my multiplier was. What's my what's my growth or decay rate, right? And this is going to be a decay rate because um, we know the fish are dying, right? Uh, the the virus is causing the number of fish in the lakes to go down, right? And and you can imagine why it's important to the the Fish and Wildlife Department to make sure that it doesn't eliminate this fish, po fish population, right? Um, now they do say one third. Okay, so some people are going to jump. Oh, it's got to be one third. B is one third. Anderson, let's move on. Okay, but it's actually not one third because they're saying fish deaths are one third. And remember, when we multiply by B, we're multiplying by what we're returning. So if a third of the fish are dying, how many are returning week after week? And the answer, if you guys want to go this route, take, take this back to like depreciation, we could do one minus a third, right? And that is, of course, going to give us two-thirds. So we've got two-thirds of those fish coming back week after week. And if I write this function first, y equals 1,800 times two-thirds to the x power, now I've got a, a very, very helpful tool for the purposes of sketching. Uh, I've got an equation. And I set up a Desmos window ahead of time for this um, because, remember, our sketch graphs, for the purposes of, of, of helping us do some solving, graphs are at best estimation. But we can throw technology on there and we can manipulate some technology. Now we can get far more exact because things like Desmos, things like graphing calculators, those kinds of things make us far more precise than we can be by hand. But when we sketch this together here in a second, we will be using um, the, the, the visual that Desmos gives us. Uh, in order to do so. So here we go. Y equals, I'm going to type in 1800. Okay. And then I've got to type in two thirds. I can just type in two divided by three and then two the X power. Oh, shoot. Got to take care of that. I've got to close my parentheses first. You can see the problem if I don't. All right. There we go. Two the X power. And now I see that nice exponential decay curve, right? It's kind of what we thought it would be. All right. 
Um, I see right here, I've got a starting value of 1800. That's going to be important. And then maybe you want to, you know, kind of hone in on a couple other points here. You know, there's one 1200. Uh, there's two, let's see how close can I get there? Two and come on, come on. There you go. Two 800 and so on and so forth. Um, in order to do this sketching, you might just need to make one or two more points. Um, and I'll show you this pretty quick here. Um, my, my, my graph, if I go back to my notes here, is just going to be an x-axis and a y-axis, right? A, a single quadrant graph, something like this. Ah, okay. And maybe I'll make a dot up here and I'll just let everyone know that that is the point 1800. And then, of course, I'm going to give myself a nice exponential decay function like we see. Okay, and then I think we saw another point on that graph. I think it was like the point 2... 800. And, and I think that's going to, I should label this X and Y and so on, right? And if you really want to get fancy, you can put down here what X represents, number of, of weeks the lake was infected with the virus, and the Y axis could be trout population, right? But for the purposes of a sketch, I think we did okay. Now, let's move on and answer part B. Part B says, theoretically, will the trout ever completely disappear from the lake? Use your graph to justify the answer. Um, this is something that we've talked about quite a bit, and I'm going to highlight the x-axis, and I'm going to throw your guys' way the word asymptote again. Remember, that is that invisible boundary that the, the, the graph will never cross, okay? It's going to come close to it, but it's never, ever, ever going to touch it. I don't care how many weeks we go, that red line is never, ever, ever going to cross that x-axis, okay? Now, the key word here is theoretically. Theoretically... That graph is never going to touch that x-axis. However, there's going to be a time, and you could use technology to figure out when this is, right? You could you could tie a table to this function, and you could carry this thing down, right? You could even grab your graph, and you could drift way out there, okay? And you could figure out how long it's going to be until we've got one trout left. Because knowing what we know about biology, if we've got one trout, it's not going to be long before we have zero trout. You know what I'm saying? Right? If we've got one trout, it's not going to be long until we got zero trout. I'm going to let you wrestle with that, right? And figure out the difference between in theory and in, um, you know, applied reality, right? Uh, because they're different, right? Math behaves differently in our work and on paper than it does in the real world. And if we can differentiate between the two, it makes us a more effective problem solver. Let's go ahead and keep on keeping on here. We're going to look at a couple more, um, you know, strategies here as we look at a, a new example in 7-69 here. Suppose the annual fees for attending a public university were seven grand in 2010, and the annual cost can be seen in the graph to the right. Note that X represents the number of years after 2010. So let's go ahead and start figuring some stuff out. It says write an equation to represent this situation. Well, ladies and gents, I'm going to show you guys some things that I notice. I'm going to use green on this one, right? Just pulling off the graph there. I notice as we go from zero to one, right? There's one multiplication there as we go from zero to one. My Y's go from 7,000 to 7,700. Oops, 7,700. Sorry about that. That means my B value can be represented by 7,700 divided by 7,000. Okay. Right? And of course, I could just divide this, um, you know, or break this down into to one multiplication. But this works out to be 7,700 divided by 7,000. You could reduce that fraction. It'd be 11 over uh, 10, right? Which is, of course, 1.1. So there's my B value. The other thing that we need is my A value. My A value is my starting value. And I see that right here because they've identified that intercept for me. And now I've got what it's going to take to write this equation. Y equals... 7,000 times my B value, 1.1 to the X power. Okay, so there we go. We've got the equation. Use this model to predict the cost of attending a public university in the first year you would be eligible to enroll. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when are you going to be eligible? I don't know. That's different for all of us. Okay, if you're eligible, I'm going to go back to Desmos and have Desmos do this work for me. If you're eligible... To enroll, oops, 77,000, uh, 7, sorry, 
times 1.1 to the, if you're eligible to enroll in five years, then you're going to throw a five in there. And what's that cost going to be? Well, to the nearest penny, $11,273.57. But if you're eligible in four years, well, then there's your cost. If you're eligible in three years, but if you're not eligible for six years, ooh, yikes, right? All of those things um, have uh, have different levels of cost uh, do, based on our model, okay? Uh, the quicker we can get to college, maybe the better in terms of our pocketbook. And you can see there, I just used the calculator on uh, Desmos to help me out with that, okay? Um, part C is a really, really cool question. All right, it says, what was the cost of, um, what was the cost in 2000? Assuming that the rate of increase was the same during the time period from 2000 to 2010. Well, here's the deal. This right here is the cost. I'm going to just kind of draw a red line right here. This was the cost in 2010. So what we need to do is we need to back up in time 10 years if we're going to estimate this. All right. Okay. Well, how do I represent backing up in 10 years? Think about that for a second as I get my model set up. How do I back up in time 10 years, right? I don't have a DeLorean. I don't have a time machine. What do I do here to represent this cost 10 years back in time? We just went forward in time in part B, right? We put in positive numbers. If I'm going back in time 10 years, it's not going to be a positive 10, is it? It's going to be a negative 10. There you go. Okay. And I'm going to use Desmos to work this out here. Um, and, and you can see, I can just go back into my Desmos calculator. I can delete that six. I can type in a negative 10. Desmos does take it. That is $2,698.80. And I use the approximately equal to sign. Okay. Pretty nice. Pretty nice to go to that public university 10 years ago. Okay. Were you eligible 10 years ago? Probably not. You're probably in kindergarten 10 years ago, right? Maybe not an option for you. Okay. Here's um, part D. And we kind of started talking about this uh, earlier in the previous question. And it's, it's a really, really important question. Are you confident with your prediction in part C? Like, are we confident like this, you know, that it costs us much money? Explain. Well, first and foremost, we could probably go look this up. So our model to make a prediction probably isn't going to be helpful. So maybe spending the time doing some researching to figure out what it actually costs and having, um, you know, uh, exact known, like that would be better. But in general, like it's not a good idea to, to make an extrapolation that far back in time. Okay, this is well outside of our known data. I've got um, two pieces of data here, and they are 2010 and then uh, 2011, that looks like. So to go that far back in time, probably not a good idea. I would not be confident in this. I wouldn't bet anyone on this, okay? Um, in 2012, the annual cost was actually $8,244. How accurate is our model? Well, 2012 is two years after 2010. So our model, our model predicts, what is that, 8,470 bucks? We were pretty gosh darn close. All right? We were pretty gosh darn close. But this means we have a residual. And let's see if I can do this. It's 226, I believe, right? We have a residual of negative $226. And what this tells me is that because our residual is negative here, the fees aren't growing exactly by 10% every year. And to assume like a 10% growth over time, probably not fair. All right. Companies like this or universities are going to have costs that fluctuate. Okay, and they might go up, they might go down because they have to keep students coming, right? If they just go up over time, it's not going to necessarily be um, ad advantageous to their pocketbooks, right? Okay, we've got uh, three questions, uh, 73, 74, and 75. 74 is a challenging question. I still expect you guys to try it. Try these things, ask questions. Ladies and gents, thanks for watching. Have a great day.